I'm here today in defense of common sense. I don't think I'm particularly brilliant or novel, and I certainly don't intend to be. I hope to be a herald of sort of ancient wisdom that was often more caught than even taught in this country, though it certainly was taught as well. And in a world, in a moment turned upside down and gone mad with the woke mind virus, common sense can indeed sound crazy. As G.K. Chesterton said, we shall soon be in a world in which a man may be howled down for saying that two and two make four, in which people will persecute the heresy of calling a triangle a three-sided figure and hang a man for maddening a mob with the news that the grass is green. Well, that world has come to pass, and if you doubt that, I would refer you to my Twitter mentions. And the maddening truth that I'm here to represent is this, is that American Christians should wholeheartedly support an America first governing agenda, platform, and policy proposals. In fact, we shouldn't just support it. American Christians should demand that from our government. And this isn't driven by racism. This isn't driven by xenophobia. This isn't driven by fascism or whatever new ism the left will come up with and sling at us like mud. For Christians, this is driven by love. Love for our national neighbor citizens, our flesh and blood American neighbors with whom we share this country, this land, this people, this history, this heritage, and this future. I continue to have moments of radicalization throughout my life. The first one was probably when my firstborn son arrived. And as I've added two more sons to the wolf pack, I've just become increasingly radical because I've got, I've got three white male boys, so I'm probably on an FBI watch list. And I care about the country that they grow up in. And I care that the government that they live under puts their interests first. The great English Baptist pastor and theologian, Andrew Fuller, who Charles Spurgeon said was the greatest theologian of his century, delivered an incredible sermon in defense of love of his nation, a primary love of putting it first. It was in 1803 when the British feared an imminent invasion from Napoleon. We'd probably be all better off if I just read the sermon, but let me share a portion with it now. It's entitled Christian Patriotism. I highly recommend that you read it. Baptists actually do have good contributions on this subject. Fuller preaches his sermon out of Jeremiah 29.7, where the Lord commands the Israelites who are in exile, captives in Babylon, to seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Fuller writes, I do not suppose that the case of these people corresponds exactly with ours, but the difference is of such a nature as to heighten our obligations. They were in a foreign land, a land where there was nothing to excite their attachment, but everything to provoke their dislike. Now, if such was the duty of men in their circumstances, can there be any doubt with respect to ours? Ought we not to seek the good of our native land, the land of our father's graves, a land where we are protected by mild and wholesome laws, administered under a paternal prince, a land where civil and religious freedom are enjoyed in a higher degree than in any other country in Europe, a land where God has been known for many centuries as a refuge, a land where there are greater opportunities for propagating the gospel, both at home and abroad, than in any other nation under heaven. Now, this was in the early 1800s, so Fuller hadn't seen what America became, so I would argue that's America now. But the answer to his rhetorical questions is yes, we should seek the good of our land. He rallied his fellow countrymen, his Christian countrymen, to be willing to take up arms and fight the French. And I don't mean David, but I don't also not mean David, if need be. <laughs> but if we listen to the leading and loud voices in the Christian world today, they would have us beat our ballot boxes into plowshares and retreat from the public square. Just recently, a major Presbyterian pastor literally said, worldly power is anathema. 
And of course, in Southern Baptist land, we've been repeatedly harangued by leading voices telling us that we must content ourselves to a silo of prophetic witness, where we stand outside the halls of power and we shout truth into these global elites ruining our nation and hoping somehow it pricks their conscience, but we don't roll up our sleeves and get our hands dirty and take control of things for the sake of the good of our citizens. So we should reject that. And so my two very brief points here is essentially this, that a Christian case for America First government one rejects national Gnosticism. It rejects national Gnosticism and embraces ordered loves in order to help our nation flourish. So first, reject national Gnosticism. What do I mean? Well, too many Christians continue to fall prey to this most ancient of Christian heresies, you know, various forms of Gnosticism. And I don't have time to go into all the depths of Gnosticism and what it means, but essentially it's this idea that the material world is inherently bad because it was actually created by a lower malevolent deity. And so in order to escape the material world, we need to acquire a secret knowledge that frees us. That's our salvation. So they see the physical world as totally bad. To that, as Christians, we would say, that's not true. The material world, the physical world is fallen, but there is grace in our nature. And there is goodness in this world that God put us into. And so for far too many Christians, they act like this when it comes to the idea of nation state governments. This world is not our home. I'm sure you've heard that one. Christ's kingdom is not of this world. I'm sure you've heard that one too. And it's the classic bingo card of the Christian retreatist. And Andrew Fuller also took this objection head on. He said, though as Christians we are not of the world and ought not to be conformed to it, yet being in it, we are under various obligations to those about us as husbands, wives, and my paper is sticking, <laughs> parents, children, masters, servants, there's some inflammatory language, we cannot be insensible that others have a claim upon us, and we upon them as well. It is the same as members of a community under one civil government. And so Christians need to reject national Gnosticism. Just because we have a spiritual faith and we're bound for the celestial city, that doesn't mean what we do here in our city now doesn't matter. Yesterday, Dr. Hazoni asked, why does nobody ever include the Bible in those Twitter photos of stacks of summer reading? So let me go to the Bible right now. Acts 17, 25, 26. This is Paul making an apologetic appeal to believe in God. And he says, and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he gives everyone life, breath, and everything else. That everything else is the physical world. From one man, he made all nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. So Christians shouldn't be national Gnostics because God is not a national Gnostic. He made the nations. He marked the boundaries. In fact, many people don't know this, but in the original Greek, the word for boundaries is actually a big, beautiful wall. I'm, I'm kidding, of course, but the point stands. <laughs> Borders are a good thing, and God has given them to us. And within those borders, we find the rooted nature of community in which we identify ourselves and we call home. As Chesterton said, a man's reasons for not wanting his country to be ruled by foreigners are very like his reasons for not wanting his house to be burned down because he could not even begin to enumerate all the things that he would miss. Christians used to say WWJD. Well, these days, far too many Christians are saying WWWEFD, and that needs to end because we live here in the United States. So reject national Gnosticism. Second, we need to embrace ordered loves. We need to embrace what Augustine called the ordo amoris, a right ordering of love that begins with our, as Christians, putting God at the top. He is the priority. We fix our full affections and our heart and our mind and God as the highest order of our loves. And then we love everything else in relation to that and according to as God has commanded us. When I get to cross-examine Christians who disagree with me about this biblical imperative to demand America first, I like to ask a few questions. Do you love your family? Now, if they say no, we're about to have a different conversation. But most of them say yes. I say, do not love your family more than you love a stranger. When you go to sleep at night, do you lock your doors? Well, congratulations, you're a nationalist. 
Because you have to understand that in our individual lives, we have a hierarchy of affections. We have protections and responsibilities that we give to these people that God has ordered in our lives with us. You've perhaps seen the distracted boyfriend meme where the guy's walking down the street and there's a girl walking past and he's turning around looking at her and his girlfriend is mad. Well, right now, the distracted boyfriend is America. And the girlfriend who's mad are the American citizens. And the girl he's looking at is another $10 billion aid package to Ukraine. And that needs to end. The government should focus on us and we should ask that they do that. There's more biblical data to support this claim, particularly in the concept of ordered affections and ordered loves. In Exodus 20:12, God tells the Israelites that they should honor their father and mother. Why? So that they should live long in the land. Paul picks this up in Ephesians. It's the first commandment with a promise. It's very nationalistic. It's very country first. Honor your father and mother so that your land would do well. You love your family, you love your land, you love your God, and you place God over all. Lewis said that we all know this love, that is love of country, can become a demon when it becomes a god. But some begin to suspect that it is never anything but a demon. When they have to reject half the high poetry and half the heroic action a race has achieved, we cannot even keep Christ's lament over Jerusalem. He, too, exhibited love for his country. And so this right ordering love for Christians is crucial because there are some temptations for us as Christian nationalists. We must make sure that God and Christ sit on the seat, the highest seat of our affections, even as we demand rightly that our government serve our citizens first. Douglas Wilson, you like that? Go from Augustine to Douglas Wilson in one breath. Put it like this. Suppose a man goes to Hallmark store to buy his mom a Mother's Day card. While browsing in that aisle, he notices another man selecting a card that imprudently says, to the best mother in the world. Does he have the right to knock the card out of the other man's hand and start a fist fight with him there in the store because that twerp falsely claimed his mother was the best one in the world? This is not a trick question. No, that would not happen. A man who honors his mother rightly knows exactly why another man would honor his mother, even though, and follow me closely here, she is a different mother. A sane patriot who loves his country understands better than anyone else why another sane patriot could love a completely different country. And a jingoist is the guy who starts the fight in the Hallmark store. Now here, this is very important, I believe, for us as Christians, is that we need to recognize that other nations should love their country more than they love ours. And that's a good thing, right? Um, America first is not necessarily or always America best or America only or America forever but it's for us as American Christians, the right ordering of our affections, even as we love, we love to see the French, the Germans pay more for their defense, love their country more. We actually encourage them to love their country more by caring for their country more. I know my time is rapidly drawing to a close, so let me continue to skip over a lot of really good material and you can come find me afterwards <laughs> for it. And I think then I will just skip all the way to the close and say this. I served in the Trump administration and I saw over and over again bureaucrat after bureaucrat who took the same oath of office that I did to defend and protect the constitutions from all enemies, foreign and domestic, undermine the duly elected president for the purpose of their institutional interests and their self-satisfied, smug, you know, foreign service officer agenda. And it made me mad. And um, I hope we get a chance to get back in there and bust this trust up and so that the American people can be represented by a government that puts them first. I'll close with this. It's a beautiful poem. It's called Urbis Day, the City of God. It was later put to music and it's called I Vow to Thee My Country. And in it, Sir Cecil Arthur Spring Rice, who was a British diplomat and ambassador to the US during World War I, expresses the embodiment of how we can love our country and put it first, but always keep God higher. He says this, I vow to thee, my country, all earthly things above, entire, whole, and perfect, the service of my love, the love that asks no questions, the love that stands the test, that lays upon the altar the dearest and the best. 
the love that never falters, the love that pays the price, the love that makes undaunted the final sacrifice. And there's another country I've heard of long ago, more dear to them that love her, more great to them that know. We may not count her armies, we may not yet see her king. Her fortress is a faithful heart, her pride is suffering. And soul by soul and silently, her shining bounds increase. And her ways are ways of gentleness, and all her paths are peace. That's the country we're headed to eternally and finally, fellow Christians. But until then, this is the country that we put first and our government per puts first. Thank you.